The fantasy news must flow! Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to another episode of Fantasy News. I am your disheveled goblin host, Daniel Green, and today I'm going to be announcing a whole new merch line. But first, we got to get in some controversial stories because I don't know what's in the water right now, but there are some movements happening within the publishing of books and more space. And we're going to go ahead and start off with the and more part of that because it seems that Dungeons and Dragons new license is going to tighten its grip on competition. Now, for those of you who do not know, Dungeons and Dragons originally had an open game license, which means many companies could make content using the core mechanics of Dungeons and Dragons. This circumvented for Wizards of the Coast a lot of potential legal trouble down the road and helped promote their own game as this thriving community was constantly filled with new iterations, interpretations, imaginings of what you could do with the core mechanics. Now, despite a promise from Wizards of the Coast last month, the original OGL will become an unauthorized agreement, and it appears no new content will be permitted to be created under the original license. I do want to make abundantly clear this is based off of a leaked document dated for late December. The original agreement was released in 2000, but since then, Wizards of the Coast has said they are going to be updating this to account for me and the new issues arising, especially now in the digital space. That's why things like NFTs and Bitcoin are talked about in the new OGL, which is being referred to as 1.1. There's also apparently a section here about clamping down on bigoted content being created while using their mechanics. Yeah, you can't use their game as a basis to jump off and create hateful content for it. I don't think anyone's gonna be against that. But looking into the finer details of what's going on here, well, fan-made content that's just meant for fans to share for free among themselves and not make profit of it will largely be unaffected. The hundreds, if not thousands of companies who have relied on the rather lenient standard of the original OGL are going to have to massively overhaul how they do business. To quote from the agreement, the updated license only allows for creation of role-playing games and supplements in printed media and static electronic files. It does not allow for anything else, including but not limited to things like videos, virtual tabletop, or VTT campaigns, computer games, novels, apps, graphic novels, music, songs, dances, and pantomimes. You may engage in these activities only to the extent allowed under the Wizard of the Coast fan content policy or separately agreed between you and us. The document emphasizing, if you want to publish SRD-based content on or after January 13th, 2023 and commercialize it, your only option is to agree to the OGL. Now, it doesn't seem that Wizards of the Coast is pushing for royalties yet, at least for anyone making under $750,000 for the content they're creating. They've even created a tier system for which category you fall under, depending on how much money you're making with your products. But it doesn't matter what tier you fall under if you are making something based off of their IP, they still want you to register with them. And it's also directly stating that Wizards of the Coast will have access perpetually and forever to use anything created under this agreement for their own purposes, saying, Wizards of the Coast will have a non-exclusive, perpetual, irrevocable, worldwide, sub-licensable, royalty-free license to use that content for any purpose. Which is kind of funny because they don't offer the same perpetual anything under this agreement for most people. And you'd have to get a custom agreement with Wizards the coast to possibly have that, and they can actually terminate your ability to use this license with only 30 days notice. And they already said in this statement that they expect to receive a lot of pushback, which yeah, I think they will. Basic. After watching this great video, I highly recommend you check out for a slightly better informed input on this situation because I am not someone who has a legal background. Well, they are. The worst part of this, in my opinion, is that allegedly they are specifically using language in here to deauthorize the original version of the open game license, which had language in it to try and future-proof it for publishers, and instead say this is the only authorized version due to a clause that said you could publish under any authorized version of the OGL. Them now saying that it's deauthorized is theoretically trying to take away from people who were protected by that previously. And that just doesn't taste very good allegedly, theoretically, don't sue me, please. Really, I just see this as an opportunity for competitors, but hey, I'll just keep my eye on the situation and keep you updated. Next news, which involves Kayla. Because the new merch line is finally launching for patrons today and will be available for the entire Goblin Horde 
Monday. No. Tuesday. Tuesday. There we go. Kayla, tell them the rest. <laughs> right, yeah, so basically I had wanted to challenge myself to design Daniel some new merch here. I know that I have a different style of things that I like to wear and I thought I might try to make something that other people might enjoy. So uh, this line is going to be going more towards minimalist styles, but still with the Goblin Horde flair. This is a new company that we're going to be working with called Fourth Wall, who have so far treated us great and we haven't had anything but great things to say. There is a couple of Mame type shirts like spank books mm -hmm. as seen here to keep in the tone of the Goblin Horde, but we also have things like the Welcome, Welcome, Welcome and the brand new Goblet logo yep. to incorporate a new stylistic flair to the merch available to you all. Yeah. How fun! We have some crop hoodies, we have full hoodies, we'll have t-shirts, we have two hats available. But this will only be available for a limited time. Yes. The that's... talk is ticking. Yes. Clock. Patreon supporters will get early access from today uh, through Monday, and then starting Tuesday, January 10th, we're going to open it to the public um, and everyone else. So for Patreon, you will get uh, the access password to the site as well as a 10% off promo code as a thank you for supporting the channel and supporting our new merch. And so if you want the only hoodie that's certified both comfy and cozy by professional goblins. Visit danielbgreen.com today if you're a patron and Tuesday if you're not. Love you. Now we need to talk about the narration update when it comes to AI. If you're tired of hearing about artificial intelligence, trust me, it's not gonna stop anytime soon. Once again though, this was something we actually knew was coming down the road. Actually, it was expected back in November that Apple was going to make AI narrated audiobooks available on their platform. It's actually something we covered here quite a while ago on the channel, but now it's happened. Currently, if you go into the Apple audiobook store and look specifically for AI generated books, you will be met with a truckload of results. And of course, this inspired headlines like death of the narrator. Now, do not get me wrong. Like any AI infused technology, this will improve rapidly with time. But as of right now, it's a little soulless and doesn't exactly know when like the climax of your book is happening. But yeah, it does sound really, really good. And it's certainly not just Siri reading text. And I can't help but see the benefit this could potentially bring to a lot of authors who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford to have an audiobook done for their book, suddenly having a massive part of especially the indie publication market made available to them. As someone who's a fan of indie authors, I do like that side of things, but I'm also dating a voice actor who has turned down jobs to help make AI things like this because of how damaging she knows it could potentially be in the long run of this industry. This is nothing entirely new, and this technology has already been utilized in many under industries. It's just a very large player in the publishing space now introducing it in a major way kind of quietly. Like I didn't know this was gonna suddenly be there, but now it is. My opinion, like with AI generated art, is it's a tool and it's how we regulate the usage of it that'll dictate whether or not the overall impact is positive or negative. What I like about this is for potentially disabled readers who cannot physically read a book, this means that every book in the world could potentially just get an audio book that does lack a bit of performance for now. And what I don't like about this is obviously it affects the jobs of people like this. So I absolutely understand the worries in the industry, but I also am not one of these people who supports just completely crushing AI doing potentially some good as well. And it's just one of these things that we're going to be in the tumultuous time of trying to best regulate it for now. And there's going to be mistakes made. And that's all I can really say. Ah, okay. That was two really heavy stories back to back. Let's go ahead and hit on some lighter news with the fact that the Galanx editions of the Witcher are officially available. No, these are not new, 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 new Witcher covers. And instead are just some of the ones we saw teased before finally put out into the world. I actually no longer have a complete set of the Witcher books, so I'm gonna be keeping an eye out for these to at least see them in some kind of review or in person before I grab them, but they might be become my set of the Witcher because I do like the color and I like when color pops on shelf. Look at that red Lord of the Rings. He's so red. And then I'm only covering this because I'm tired of seeing some people get it wrong news. Sherlock Holmes is entering the public domain. 
is not the full story. The rest of Sherlock Holmes is entering the public domain is the actual story. Nerd out with me here for a moment because Sherlock Holmes is one of my favorite characters of just fiction as a whole, but a vast percentage of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes writings have already been in the public domain, and this is just the final set of Sherlock stories entering that sphere. And that would be the case book of Sherlock Holmes. Now there's been a long running legal debate from the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle estate, arguing that although the early works featuring Sherlock Holmes were public domain, the fact that later books written by Doyle are not means the character remains under copyright. But now that this book is in public domain, that is no longer even an argument worth having because everything is for sure in public domain. But I've seen so many tweets saying like, oh, now we're gonna get so many Sherlock Holmes at He's it. already one of the most adapted characters in the history of fiction. It's not going to suddenly we get a whole lot of Sherlock Holmes stuff We've had a whole lot of Sherlock Holmes stuff. It just means that the later parts of Sherlock Holmes' character development and elements of the story that are happening in those final books can now be folded in. But in the final piece of news we'll be covering here today, it seems that 1899 has been canceled over at Netflix. And no, nothing I've seen in my research looking into this points to that author from Brazil making noise about them potentially stealing from her, which I personally did not find to have much merit, contributing at all to 1899's cancellation. In fact, what's on Netflix did a pretty good job making the argument it's not due necessarily even raw viewership numbers, which were fairly good for the show, at least at first, and that's where the Achilles heel might be. Apparently, while a lot of people started the show, not a ton of people finished it. And maybe it's just because I'm used to how YouTube handles things where they tend to value how long people watch your videos if they're a longer video over anything else, but that actually kind of makes sense to me. Mainly, I'm just bummed because I really did enjoy season one and the people who brought us dark weren't missing with this one, but we'll never have all those mysteries answered, damn. But this has just been your latest episode of Fantasy News. If you're a patron, go ahead and check out the merch store now available to you with a discount. And for everyone else, it'll be available Tuesday. Available. Like and subscribe if you have not already, and have a good one, y'all. Peace. And of course, I'd like to record a special shout out to my latest high tier patrons, Captain Jack Reckham, JP, Kane Delvin, Sir Rusty, Christopher Smith, and Jason Bouchamp.